do be from the <laughs> press, quite a lot of people get the idea that PGD is all about trying to uh, produce perfect babies, but in the same way as we're a long way off the male pregnancy for our chairman, uh, I think we're a long way off producing perfect babies, and it, in fact, I don't think we're ever going to get to the stage where we can produce perfect babies. Instead, it's like these. What PGD is all about is using the, the IVF technology that we've got available to select embryos that have been tested for specific genetic uh, disorders and uh, are deemed to be suitable uh, for transfer to the uterus if they're going to be unaffected by this specific genetic disorder. These embryos are still um, subjected to the, the same kind of rigours of a pregnancy and still have a lot of developing to do. So they may still not be perfect babies, they've still uh, got the same risk of having any other genetic disorder or congenital birth defect that any embryo has. So they're not perfect babies. So the IVF technology that's used in PGD, this is standard IVF. And what you can see on the, the left hand side here is lady is given a hormone either by injections or sometimes a, a nasal spray to stimulate her ovaries to produce more eggs than in a normal menstrual cycle. Um, she's scanned on a regular basis to watch the eggs developing in the ovary and once they get to a certain stage, the still is inserted usually through the vagina and the eggs are sucked out from the ovaries and transferred to a test tube as you can see there and from there they're transferred into a little dish that you can see right down at the bottom of the screen. And at the same time, her partner produces a sperm sample and it's added to the dish for standard IVF or in another related procedure called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm ejection, a single sperm is taken from that sample and injected directly into each of the eggs. The eggs are then incubated or the fertilized eggs are incubated and left to divide. And they go into two cells, then four cells, eight cells, 16 cells and so on until you've got a whole embryo. And usually with standard IVF on day three, after the, the egg has the fertilized egg has divided, it's transferred back into the, the lady's uterus uh, just through the, the vagina of the syringe, and that's usually just uh, done without any anesthetic. The retrieving of the eggs is done under a bit of local anesthetic and sedation. The difference with uh, PGD from conventional IVF or ICSI is once the cell has got to the stage of having divided into between six and eight cells, usually on day three after fertilization, it's like this. We see this kind of situation here, and one of these cells can be sucked out using the pipette that you see on the right hand side of these photographs, and it's that single cell that we use for the genetic testing. And the genetic testing that is carried out is varies depending on what the genetic disorder that the, the parents are at risk of having a child with. Many coaches is going to be speaking later about single gene PGD, which uses DNA technology. And I'm going to speak a bit about uh, chromosomal disorders that babies might be at risk of having. So this is a photograph um, from a, a blood cell. This is what we see when we, the scientists look down the microscope in the laboratories for chromosomes. And they're usually all jumbled up like a thin spaghetti. And uh, not so clever medics like me don't recognize one chromosome from another. But the clever scientists do know which chromosome is which. And it's like these. They sort them out like this. And what you can see here is um, in almost every cell of our body, we have 46 chromosomes and they come as 23 pairs. And the reason for that is we get one from mom and one from dad of each of the pairs of chromosomes. And when eggs are being made in the ovaries and sperm in the testes, the pairs of chromosomes come together, swap little bits of information, and then pull apart. So you've only got one copy of each chromosome in each egg cell and each sperm cell. After fertilization has happened, you then get back to your 46 chromosomes. And this is the chromosomes from a lady, and what you can see is there's 22 pairs of ordinary chromosomes, and then the bottom right that some of you near the front will be able to see, the lady's got two X chromosomes, and a thick side please. And the only difference between males and females is that males have only got one of these X chromosomes, but they've got an additional Y chromosome. Next slide please. And the scientists can now do all sorts of fancy things with chromosomes, they can stain them with fluorescent dyes, so as they show up under the microscope to be all different colours, and this allows them to, to recognise all chromosomes and sometimes just specific regions of chromosomes that the dyes have added to your dog. Next slide, please. So this, obviously, the staining of the chromosomes can be used on a single cell to determine the, the sex of an embryo. And what you can see here is that the 
we usually stain one of the pairs of ordinary chromosomes, just so as we know that there's only two of each chromosome in the cell. So in this case, we're staining chromosome 18 in blue, so there's two nice blue signals in both of these cells. We stain the Y chromosome red, and what you can see is one of the cells, there is a Y chromosome, the one on the right doesn't have a Y chromosome, and we stain the X chromosome green. So the cell on the left, we've <coughs> got one X chromosome, one Y chromosome, and two 18. So that's a normal male uh, embryo. And on the other side, we've got two 18s and two Xs and no Y, so that's a normal female embryo. And that's how we determine the sex of the embryos. So that's a relatively straightforward procedure. Next. So that procedure can be used for um, couples who are at risk of having a child with what we call an X linked disorder. And as males have only one X chromosome, they tend to be more seriously affected by genetic abnormalities that occur in the X chromosome. And this is just a list of some of these uh, diseases that affect males more than females. And um, perhaps the one that we see most frequently is to share muscular dystrophy, the severe type of muscular dystrophy that does shorten life and affects young boys and is really quite severely disabling. Um, next slide, please. The other uh, chromosomal uh, PGD that we can do is for parents who carry a rearrangement of their, their chromosomes. And there are various different types of balanced rearrangements of chromosomes that don't affect the health of individuals, but it puts them at risk of passing their chromosomes on in an unbalanced form. And what you can see here, again, there's something that's sitting right here at the front, you'll see that instead of all the usual pairs of chromosomes, it looks like there's only one copy of chromosome 21. But in fact, what has happened here is the second copy of chromosome 21 is attached onto this copy of chromosome 14. So it does not affect the health of the individual, um, because the right amount of chromosome of the female is present, but it could be passed on in an unbalanced form. Next slide, please. And what you can see here is that the previous patient has passed on both the normal copy of chromosome 21 and the 14 that's got a 21 on it, and then of course another 21 has been inherited from the opposite parent. So if that pregnancy continued, that baby would be born with an extra copy of chromosome 21 and would be affected by Down syndrome that we all know about. So again, PGD can be used to pick up that from the embryos and we can put back just the embryos that have got either the balanced chromosomes, the translocation that the parent had, or the completely normal chromosomes. Next slide, please. Here we have a different type of translocation, and this isn't such a good photograph of chromosomes. I couldn't find a, a good one, but those of you that, again, if you look closely, what you can see is different about them here is that one of the copies of chromosome 1 here looks much longer than the other, and one of the copies of chromosome 8 is shortened. And the reason for that is a region of chromosome 8 and chromosome 1 have swapped places, and again, it's not affecting the health of the parent that could be passed on in an unbalanced form. And that fluorescent in situ hybridization, the dyeing of the chromosomes can be used to pick up these unbalanced versions of these chromosome arrangements. Next slide, please. And it takes quite a lot of working up in the laboratory to detect these, that the chromosomes can pull apart in various different ways. And the scientists have to work out what signals they would see from the stains on the chromosomes in all of these different scenarios, and work out which ones would be balanced and which ones would be unbalanced. And it means that just the chromosomes that are known to have balanced, uh, the embryos that are known to have balanced chromosomes can be replaced. And sometimes after a cycle of PGD, it may turn out that none of the embryos are suitable for replacement, and that can be very disappointing to couples. So, and this is the sort of thing that scientists actually see down in the laboratory. As you see, it, it's really kind of labor-intensive work, just checking all these signals that are coming from the chromosomes to make sure that they're balanced before the embryos are deemed suitable for replacement. So we thought about how uh, PGD uh, developed. Um, it was actually something that was developed in the UK back in the, the 60s, obviously just on experimental animals at that time. And it was in the 80s before it started uh, doing work on humans. The first baby born following PGD was uh, back in 1989, so quite a long time now. And some of the babies born following PGD are now young adults. So we are getting to know more and more information about whether there, should, there could be side events or anything. In 2001, there had then been 3,000 uh, PG cycles worldwide carried out, and it's just escalated from them, but more and more. In Glasgow, we started performing uh, NHS-funded PGD in 2002, and we've now had 15 <coughs> babies born following uh, PGD, and they're all healthy babies. So how do we know when somebody uh, would be suitable for PGD? What brings them to medical attention? 
Well, it could be a parent, as we, we heard the, the one um, that was on the TV last night, uh, a parent who's got a condition that we know is dominantly inherited. It may be that there's a sister of a, a boy who's got Duchenne muscular dystrophy and who has been tested to see if she carries the X chromosome that's got the faulty gene on it. And it may be that they've already had a child affected by a genetic disorder or who's been found to have unbalanced chromosomes. Or it could be if that's been, it's like this, or if it's been picked up in pregnancy and they've had to undergo a termination of pregnancy, either because the baby's been found to have a recessive disease during the pregnancy or been found to have a chromosome abnormality. It may be a couple who have experienced recurrent miscarriages, because sometimes these chromosome rearrangements that I told you about, if they're in the unbalanced form, they're not compatible with survival of the pregnancy and it's lost as an early miscarriage. And couples can quite often be trying for a pregnancy for a long, long time before they get the chromosomes checked and we understand that the reason for the miscarriages is these uh, chromosome rearrangements. And similarly, if a man carries a balanced translocation, he can sometimes experience infertility. And again, couples may have been trying for quite a period of time, or even been attending assisted conception units and just never had their chromosomes checked to find out that the reason for the male infertility is a chromosome rearrangement. Next slide, please. What I was going to discuss here is that these couples who are at risk of having a, a baby with a, a genetic problem or a chromosome problem, the risks vary depending on what the problem is. As you can see, as a parent who has a chromosome rearrangement like the ones I told you about, the risk of them having a baby with unbalanced chromosomes will vary depending on the particular chromosomes involved. And it may well be that they've got a less than 1% risk of having a child with unbalanced chromosomes, but they're having these frequent miscarriages or experiencing fertility problems. Some of the chromosome patients, the risk might be as high as 30%. If it's a mother who's a carrier of gene for an X linked condition, such as the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, then they've got a 25% risk of having a boy affected by the, the condition. They've also got a 25% risk of having a girl who might be mildly affected depending on the condition, or be just be a carrier like the mother and have to go through this process when she grows up and becomes an adult. And that's something else that's a bit controversial with PGD in that should we be putting back female embryos that we know carry excellent disorders, knowing that they're going to have to go through the same things their mother in years to come. And next one, if it's the father that's affected by an excellent disease, we know that all of his daughters will be carriers of the condition or will be affected. So in that situation, we know we put back just boys that they'll be free of the condition. And that's something that we have experienced at the PGD clinic in Glasgow. If it's here that uh, both parents, if it's the boy that we want to treat Collins and he's actually affected by a dominant condition, then it's a 50% chance of it being passed on and the child being affected. Or if both parents are carriers of what we call a recessive gene, where it's only their mum and dad who both, both pass on their <coughs> of the gene that the child's affected, 25% risk of the baby being born with that. And again, Mary Porges is going to speak to you about that bit later on. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of offering PGD? Well, we know that it certainly reduces the risk of having a child with a serious genetic disorder. It reduces the need for repeated terminations of pregnancy that these couples have sometimes experienced if they have prenatal diagnosis carried out during the pregnancy. It's found that the baby's affected and they have a termination of pregnancy. And it widens their choice as to what they can do. And Again, something that might be a bit more controversial is it's maybe better than prenatal diagnosis when the severity of the condition is variable. That some couples feel that if the condition is very serious or it's a lethal condition and they have a prenatal diagnosis carried out and the baby's bound to be affected, it's never an easy decision to terminate a pregnancy, but it's sometimes that wee bit easier if they know that the child's life was going to be very miserable or um, significantly shortened. And therefore, maybe we should be offering PGD more for the kind of less severe conditions of where it's variable and we can't predict the severity. And again, we reduce repeated miscarriages and these are uh, translations. The disadvantages are it's expensive, it's labor intensive, it's expensive. And even in centres that have been carrying out PGD for many, many years now, the success rate remains low, that it's between 20 to 25 percent. In Glasgow, ours is sitting a wee bit above the 25%, which is certainly still kind of less than the 30%. And 
Prenatal diagnosis is still recommended for these couples after they're undergoing PGD just to check that we've got the results right, but very few couples actually take us up on that offer of having prenatal diagnosis carried out. Like any IVF technology, it's emotionally and physically draining for the, the couples. It's a lot to go through, and we'll hear a bit more about that from other speakers. And say there's uncertainty about the long term effects of the procedure, but we're getting more and more information that there doesn't seem to be any adverse effects. And what are the alternatives? They can opt not to have children or no further children if they've already got a child affected by the disease. They can just take that 50%, 25%, 30% risk. They can have prenatal diagnosis, termination of pregnancy. They can apply for adoption, but that's actually very difficult these days because very few babies are put forward for adoption. And in some situations, um, artificial insemination with donor sperm or egg donation if it's a recessive disorder where the risk is only um, if both parents pass on the autogene. And the controversies, well one of the controversies is probably the family balancing that we've already kind of discussed in a way, but these are um, genuine reports from newspapers in that some people who have a genetic disorder themselves choose to have a child with the same genetic disorder rather than a child that's here of it. And the, the deaf have said that it's much easier for them to manage if they've got a deaf child because communication would be easier. And why should they not get the chance to choose to have a deaf child when uh, hearing couples are allowed the chance to choose to have a hearing child? And again, there's been a couple in America, both affected by achondroplasia, who would choose to have a child with achondroplasia rather than a child of normal stature. And the HLA that we've uh, spoken about, tissue typing for your siblings, um, again, it is slightly controversial, the baby being born purely to, to save the life of another child. The couples will argue that it's not being born purely to save the life of another child, that they actually want the one that's being created as well. But we can discuss that in the next slide. And I thought I'd just end by telling you a, a human story. This is Oliver, and I actually first met Oliver's parents uh, when his older sister, Charlotte, was born, and she had a heart defect and had some kind of unusual features that made us suspect that she had a chromosome abnormality. But we checked her chromosomes and they were normal, and we checked her and raised different tissues and they were normal. Uh, her mum became pregnant again, and during the pregnancy it was discovered that Oliver had the same heart defect as his sister, and we got the scientists to again look at our technology and moved on, and using these fish techniques that I've told you about, we then realised that Oliver's older sister Charlotte had an unbalanced chromosome translocation. Oliver was born and unfortunately he had the unbalanced translocation as well and he spent the first 18 months of his life in hospital connected to all these tubes and things and then he died. Charlotte's sister is not so severely affected uh, but has a learning disability. She's had surgery for a heart defect, she's had a rod inserted in her spine to, to straighten it and she's had problems with her hearing. And Oliver and Charlotte's parents were fed against the option of terminating a pregnancy and they had a test carried out during the pregnancy father is the carrier of the balance translation and they came to us and went through two cycles of PGD and unfortunately both of them failed. During the course of the investigations we discovered that the father had a low sperm count and we thought that they were unlikely to conceive again naturally but they did after the two cycles were over and opted to have the prenatal diagnosis which they had been reluctant to go through and unfortunately it was another baby with the unbalanced translocation and they had a termination of pregnancy. At that time in Glasgow, we were then given the information that we could fund three cycles per couple. This was a few years ago, and we let Oliver and Charlotte's parents know about this, and they leapt at the chance. And next slide, please. And this was the outcome <laughs> of their PGD. This is uh, Madeline and Ted, who are both healthy, as you can see, and their parents are delighted with them. So next slide, please. I hope from what I said to you, I've shown you that PGD <laughs> is not about designer babies and it is trying to get babies that are free of specific genetic disorders and that there is a need for it. I 